Welcome back to the Super Data Sense Podcast, everybody. Super pumped to have you back here on the show. And in today's episode, we've got uh, a special guest calling in from Mallorca, Spain, Juan Gabriel. Juan Gabriel, how are you? Fine, thanks. Here in Mallorca, as you say, enjoying the sun and uh, confinement again, probably. Yeah, yeah, man. Um, it's been a year, right, since we spoke last time. Well, I mean, like, since we saw each other in person at Udemy Live last year, yeah? Yeah, it was in October or something like that. August, it was in August. No, October was in Berlin. October, I thought it was August. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was October. I remember, it was already cold. Oh, okay, okay, wow. Well, it's all, almost a year, almost a year. <laughs> um, yeah, so how have you been? Uh, fine things. I had the chance, you know, I travel a lot for my work. Uh, yeah. From af the week after we met over there, I had to fly to Los Angeles to give a training, then come back to Spain, flying back to Mexico, then all Europe around. But then on, on February, everything closed. And from What's that moment up? on, I've been giving online just from my house. And it's been yeah. really quite interesting, this change of having to pick a flight two or three times a month and being able to be at your own house for for six months right now. Yeah. Well, how Have you been able to like get some value out of this and maybe re recharge or um, look at your life differently? What's What's been the biggest positive takeaway of this experience? I think that the first thing I've been able to do is to enjoy my house. I mean, I remodeled my own house, but I was never there for two years flying back and forth. And finally, being able to stay at my own house, being able to see what I've built and what I am able to enjoy, you look things really different. You start to value a lot more your own life. You start to realize that, hey, you've got a garden. You can plant your own uh, crops. You can enjoy your pool and that was something that I was not conscious about when you when I was flying back and forth uh, around the globe. Hmm. Okay, gotcha. So no, that's that's really cool. Um, why were you before coronavirus? Why were you flying uh, so much back and forth? Well, uh, I became a Unity certified instructor. Unity is this video games engine that people use all around the, the world to create video games right now for PlayStations, for laptops. And I became a certified instructor after one of my travels to San Francisco. That's what, where we met for the first time, if you remember there on, on the Udemy Live 2018, it was. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was a long time ago. Wow. Yeah. Uh, 2017. Wait, was it, was it 2018, I think. Whoa, no, 2018? Because, oh yeah, wait, no, tw I didn't go to the 2018 one. I went to the one before that, I think 2017. Uh, so 2017 should be. Yeah, one of those. Okay, anyway, a long and, time ago, yeah. Yeah, a lot of, <laughs> three years is a whole life right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So after, uh, after getting to this Udemy life, uh, I was invited to go to the Unity offices because I already had some courses published on this video game uh, engine. And since they saw what I was doing in the Spanish market, they told me, hey, you are having more students learning Unity than we, than we have on our website. You are doing a super cool job. Why you don't become a certified instructor and fly all around the globe teaching at the, at the different studios. And that's what I did. I became instructor. I passed some certification exam. After that, one week after the other, I started flying around to the different uh, companies, uh, big video game studios that are launching the next big successes on, on the actual consoles uh, that requested some kind of training in different aspects. Could be optimization in video games, could be about artificial intelligence, about different mechanics to be implemented. And it's been really fun because I've been able to know a lot of people from different backgrounds, from different places that all have the same mistakes. Or all, uh, they all fail on the same stages. And it's really cool to learn from that, to be able to anticipate the next trainings and keep learning myself and teaching the others. Wow, you truly have such an interesting background and also uh, combination. I love how you carried your background in gaming into your profession as well as data science in parallel and 
you do data science, you do gaming design, and you do them together. It's like, it's crazy. It's a dream job, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember when I started my, my first job here at the Spanish video game company, that I thought that that was the job of my life. I mean, uh, playing video games, learning about that, recreating your own world, playing to be God, designing your own rules yeah. on that scenario and tweaking the, the randomness using uh, machine learning algorithms. It was like the, the job of my dreams. And after I quit and started doing it at a big scale, doing consultancy for other studios or giving trainings on behalf of Unity, it's been super cool because you see how this job is so big. It has so different aspects you can focus on that uh, you don't know what you will have to do on the next one uh, due to the, the different aspects you can focus. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's incredible. I hope you're enjoying this episode. We'll get back to it after this quick break. And the Confident Data Skills Edition 2 is out. This is the second edition of the book I published in 2018. Uh, some time has passed since then, a lot of things have changed in the space of artificial intelligence and data science. If you're not familiar with the book, then it helps develop an understanding of all of the main data science algorithms and the data science process on an intuitive level. So no code, no complex mathematics, just intuitive explanations of the algorithms and useful practical examples and case studies. This book will be extremely helpful for you if you're starting out or if you're looking to cement in that intuitive feeling for the algorithms as you progress through your career. Specifically, you will learn about decision trees, random forests, k-nearest neighbors, naive bays, logistic regression, k-means clustering, hierarchical clustering, reinforcement learning, upper confidence bound, and Thompson sampling. And in this second edition, I also added robotic process automation, computer vision, natural language processing, reinforcement learning and deep learning, and neural networks. Plus, of course, you will learn extremely valuable skills for your career, such as ethics and AI, presentation skills, data science interview tips, and much more. So if you want to get a grip and really cement in your intuitive understanding of this field, then this is the book for you. And you can get it on Amazon already today. It's called Confident Data Skills Edition 2, and it's a purple book. So enjoy, and let's get back to the podcast. Um, so tell us, like, let's, let's start from the beginning. Um, how did you get into, uh, like, how did your career go? Like, I, I think this would be a really cool case study for our listeners in terms of absolutely from any path you can get into data science. And yours was, uh, as I understand, from a developer to a game designer, to a data scientist, to instructor. So tell us a bit about that. That is a really interesting uh, story. And in fact, uh, I had the chance to give that as a TEDx talk last year because mm. uh, people were so Congrats. interested about knowing about that, that the TEDx from here, from Spain, they, they contact me, hey, why don't you speak about your life? When, why don't your, your different stages, you've, you've experienced it from learning to teaching and everything you've done in the middle and the TEDx, really enjoyed that, that conference. So mm. in, a, in some little words, when I was studying, when I was 15, 16, I wanted to become a doctor. I wanted to be a forensics doctor. I, I really enjoyed watching CSI on the, on the TV and seeing how the detectives were able to investigate about the crime scene, about solving everything. And I thought that it would be a really nice job. But... When I had to take the biology subject at the last year at the, at the college, I had a really bad teacher, a teacher that came to the class. She just opened the book, started reading page after page, and you didn't know anything because mm. reading a book to an audience is not really the, the correct way of teaching. So mm -hmm. in that case, I quit that subject and I chose maths ampliation. So I just took some different uh, subjects about mathematics that I would be able to, to see at the university la uh, the next year. And I enjoyed so much about mathematics, then I decided to do a maths degree. And wow. that was a quick switch from biology, Which? medicine to, to mathematics. That was a, the first one. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Uh-huh. From that on, I started learning about mathematics. I finished my degree. I got uh, an internship to go to Paris, but I had my girlfriend here in Mallorca. So I had to decide between going to Paris or staying here with my my ex-girlfriend right now. So I quit it. I decided not to take that internship, uh, just to uh, let it go, come back to Mallorca and decided to look for anything to do. In that case, there was only one master here available at, at my island. That was the master in teaching education to become a teacher in that case. And that's where I made the second switch from mathematician to teacher about teaching about anything, isn't it? <laughs> But I saw that's a, that requires a lot of courage, right? Like completely changing your life for the second time. Yes, because think I was just 23 years old, mm. and the, this scholarship was super huge. They paid me for a whole year in France, in Paris. They paid for all the dispenses I could have for the for for getting into the university and all that stuff. Everything was paid. But yeah, it takes it takes some consideration to let it go and decide to come back to Mallorca. It was not a, an easy an easy decision, but at that moment I thought that the girl was worth it. So that's what I what I did back in 20, Love, 2011. Yeah. Yes. So I come back here, I do this master in teaching education, and I see that education is still using a blackboard and a chalk and all that stuff instead of using new technologies. So I thought, okay, all the students have a smartphone. They use it a lot. It was when WhatsApp started uh, being really between uh, people of 12, 13, 15 years old. And I thought, okay, why don't I create uh, an application, a mobile application, in order to learn. So that's what I did. I created small applications teaching, you know, about statistics, about the typical balls falling down and creating the bell curve, about solving a linear uh, system equations, something like that. And the first day I go to class and I say to my students, hey, you can take out your smartphones and use that application to learn that. They watch me with some weird eyes, no, you want to take over smartphones. You are tricking us. That's not mm. what you want. Yes, yes, you can take that out. So it was mm. such a success, everybody learning with their smartphones instead of paper and a pencil, that I, I realized that there was a lot of room for improvement, both in education and integration. So I decided to keep creating applications and some video games, launch it to the App Store, and well, have my first salary in that case. I was working from home. I was earning some money from my applications. But there were people that didn't understand about that. And they were my parents. My parents were already around the 60s. They don't have a smartphone. And when they saw that I was working from the coach of my house, they thought, I, I don't know, that I was uh, doing some drugs or selling some <laughs> bad things around the, the neighborhood in order to earn some money. So they told me, hey, do a curriculum, send a CV, uh, look for some job, don't work from the the coach, that's not legal or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. I created a CV. There was a a company in Mallorca uh, that was really famous with just 12 people. It was creating video games and it was being some success. And that's what I did. I went, just left a CV on their table. They called me for an interview the next day. And they asked me, how many years have you been doing that? Have you been creating mobile applications and video games? And I told them, years. It's been three months. Mm-hmm. You're hired. The next day, I was hired. Oh. Wow. That was wow. my first so just because time with they me. saw what you can do. Yeah. Yeah, they thought that, well, you need to have a lot of background in order to do that. But no, you just were uh, needed to investigate a lot, to learn about new technology, to learn about new ways of applying things. Yeah, I have the, the background in mathematics for sure. And I already know a little bit about programming, about computer science. But yeah. it was just a way of putting things together in order to be able to create these first projects I I did. For sure, right now I see at those and I 
I see that I could have done really better if I had the knowledge I have right now. But for the company, it was more than enough to hire this 24 years old uh, boy uh, to be one of the next developers of the company. But the, the inflection point comes here because I was hired as a developer because I was creating mobile applications and video games. But the, the first day of my job, they saw that I was a mathematician. And they tell me, hey, you are a mathematician. We have a lot of data that we have been uh, collecting for the last year or so. Will you be able to investigate a little bit about this data and see if there's margin for an improvement or doing anything to become more successful on that? And I told them, okay, let me some days. Back in 20, 2012, there weren't the, the knowledge we have nowadays about machine learning algorithms and all that kind of stuff. Everybody was using Excel. Imagine yourself doing big data with just an Excel, you're doing some linear regressions, even trying to fit some data, replace some missing data and all that stuff. And by in, during three months, I invested a lot of time creating a dashboard that was able to get the data from the database, prepare everything to show to the, to the bosses and to the investors, and even looking some points where we could be better. For instance, creating clustering for our users when you work on free-to-play video games. The biggest problem is how to convert a free user to a payer user. So over there, we did some segmentation, some clustering about the different kind of segments that we were able to, to find on the patterns of the gameplay of the players. And we, the company was able to grow monetization 10 times. So if it was doing $1,000 per month, uh, it was doing $10,000. After just three months, we were able wow. to grow from, from 12 people to more than 40 people. And nowadays, wow. it's still one of the biggest video game company here in Spain. So you can see wow. that how I switch from developer to analytics in just one company in that case. Wow, wow. So, and that, all that thanks to data science. That is where I first uh, saw what data science was, how mm -hmm. I did have to know about the field I had to analyze. I had the mathematics, I had the, the computer science techniques, I know how to code. But I didn't know about the field. So I started investigating a lot about gaming. I start to see mm -hmm. that all the companies don't share their data, don't share their findings. And that's okay because, well, that's the key for their success. But mm -hmm. that was also the key for me to be able to teach that in the future. I saw that there was a lot of room for improvement, that there was a lot of misknowledge about the techniques, about how to do things. Mm -hmm. And that's where I started to create my first blog. It was really uh, old in that case. But I started posting about how to analyze outlayers, how to do some simple KPIs arrangement, how to collect some data and transform into valuable data. And that was interesting because a lot of companies from, from here, from Europe, start writing to me. I remember the first time that I get contact for, to go to London to give a conference about data and that companies like Square Enix or King.com or, so, or all that, those big companies just look to my blog and what I was posting because nobody did that before. Mm -hmm. And I went to those conferences and every time I went to one, I came back to Mallorca with a new offer to go to one of those big companies and my boss only had one option equal my salary here in Mallorca because otherwise I would have gone to London or to Canada or Tokyo, whatever, mm -hmm. to work mm -hmm. for those big companies. So imagine myself with just 26 years old in that case, growing one step after the other and mm -hmm. uh, becoming the head of the product of, the, of those video games here at the company. Wow. I saw the future in that case. I saw that people really liked what I was doing, really liked about these analytics, and no one else was 
sharing the results like I was doing back in those ages, on those years. So this is where I started thinking, okay, if I am able to do that in this little company and those big companies are willing to spend $100,000 on me to go to these different places and do the same for them, why am I not teaching that to the rest of the world? I could be able to create more positions to, uh, for people to apply to and really democratize the knowledge of the machine learning and uh, the data science. And that's what I did. I went to my boss. Hey, I'm quitting. I don't want to work with you anymore. Uh, he told me, okay, whose company has now reached you to go to, to work with them? And I told him, no, no other company. I just want to be my own boss. I want to teach to the rest of the people in the world what I learned. I want to keep learning. I want to become uh, a teacher. And that's where I quit. I started my first online course. I started the same way that I did. I started teaching iOS development because I first created iOS applications, then some Android applications. So the first stage was people need to learn to code. The second step was video games. I specialized in video games. So I started teaching video games. And that's when I created my first Unity courses. And the last stage was, okay, now let's dig into data. Let's create some machine learning course, some data science course, even artificial intelligence course. And that's been the last stage. In fact, when I met you back in, uh, in the Udemy Live, and we started our partnership of creating courses and translating courses. So you can see all the evolution from the beginning. I just wanted to be a doctor to mm -hmm. right now where I, I am teaching what I've learned and I keep learning at every stage of what I do. And very successfully teaching, you have 200,000, over 200,000 students. Congratulations. It's, uh, it was very exciting to see. Very cool. And um, just for our listeners, you teach uh, in Spanish. Is that correct? Yes. I never launched a course in, in English, despite everybody tells me that I should do. I know that it's also a really competitive market. And I don't see the point. There are already a, a lot of good instructors in the different aspects in, in English. In fact, almost 90% of the teachers teach in English. So it, it would be really difficult to start in that market. So all my courses, I think 77 already, are in, are in, in, and in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And we'll get to that in a second um, about uh, data science um, in Spanish. But first I wanted to talk about your experience in the video game industry. Um, I know you have a case study for us. Uh, from the video games industry. Can you, can you share it with us? We'd be very excited to learn how data science was applied. Yeah. Uh, the problem that we have in video games, as I told you, is that when you have a free video game, you can have a lot of people playing that game, but it's really difficult to get a conversion, to get one player to become a, a payer in that case. But you need a lot of payers to be able to have some money, escalate, get more people, to hire more people, and keep growing. So the biggest problem we have in the video game industry is how do we convert a player into a payer? Mm -hmm. There is a lot of metrics where to first engage the player once that is engaged, uh, how to keep coming uh, to the game, and it just gets more into the gameplay. And finally, there is some point where we try to force a conversion in that case. But the main problem is the low percentages. Do you know how, what is the percentage conversion rate from player to player usually? No, I would guess like 1% maybe. It's between 1% and 2%. Yeah, you nailed it. Wow. That means that when you have... 1 million players, only 1% will become a payer. So you have to keep an infrastructure that is able to get all these people play for service or whatever you have behind that game to hold all that data and all, that, all those players with just such amount of money that is really difficult to escalate once you get there. So 
What did I do in, in this case? It was uh, a slot machine video game. I decided to look at those players we already had. And in that case, not all the players behave the same way. For instance, some of them are more willing to share because they are social players. They want to share with their friends on, on Facebook, on Twitter, on wherever. So they are really potential viralizers. They will probably not pay for anything on your game, but they are your best marketing team because you can give some free experience to those guys if they share to their social accounts. So this is really good to have more people without having to invest more money on your video game. So this is one kind of behavior we like to detect on the, on the video game. The second one is those that are really engaged to your game. They are super engaged. They've been playing for months, but not paying for anything. So you need to detect those kind of behaviors in order to trick that conversion. They've been using a lot. So what is the best way of dealing with that? It depends. Depends on what are they really their intrinsical needs? What is the shift they need to do to become a payer? That depends. Some of them will be high rollers. They are willing to pay with a lot of mo virtual money. So they need to do a really high bid to get uh, excited in order to do another one and another one and another one until they run out of coins and they need to pay. This will be like someone that is really engaged in a, in a casino, for instance, that is paying a lot of money to keep playing in that case. And some others will be different. A lot, uh, some of them will need little personalization. For instance, being able to write in the chat, but change the color of their characters. That is really interesting for people that like to write or like to share content. And finally, there is one special case of people that is willing to look for a lot of things to get uh, money for free. And those are the special cases for advertisements. The advertisements are really cool because you can add one extra button. Hey, look at that advertising and get one, uh, one game for free. And this is really cool because when you try to put everything together, when you try to segment all your players into the different behaviors and each behavior is given what it expects, you multiply your conversion a lot. You don't expect to have money just by the old fashioned way, this one, two percent. But now you start having money from different places, places from the advertisements, from these free people that is inviting more people. So you grow your database a lot. And from the high rollers that want to invest finally on your game because you are, are giving them what they expect. Mm -hmm. So this is super interesting because it's a problem of machine learning. You have to do some big clustering. After that, you need to decide what event is really uh, useful for that and what is not. And after that, you have to create some automatization and even some neural networks that are able to feed the data almost daily in order to see exactly what is the best approach for each group. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, very interesting. So uh, you, uh, did you already know these um, four different groups and then you applied machine learning or did you use clustering to discover these groups? That's the trick. Now I'm talking from my perspective, so I know that there, this group exists. But back on the analysis, I had no clue how many groups there would be. And, I, and even if I would be able to give them a name or a label, that's why we did a, a clustering. Otherwise, probably a classification tree or random forest or, so, or something would have worked if I already had those labels. But back in, the, in, in 2014 or 2015, we didn't have a clue how many groups there would be. In fact, when I use this technique with other different uh, video games, I face that there is not four groups. There are five or six or seven. Mm -hmm. uh, that depends a lot on the, the general public that is playing to the game, the demography. 
is really important. I see that, for instance, Latin American people tends to be on this group of people that like to watch uh, an advertiser uh, in order to get some money, virtual money on for the and uh, United States or even England is more willing to go to the last stage, is where the high rollers live. And that means that this one, 2% grows to two, 3%, not more than that. But you are doubling the money that you are earning mm -hmm. and you are dividing by half the odds of losing a payer. So imagine that this 1% generates the 80, 90% of your whole money for the company. It's like mm -hmm. having a poker hand. If you lose one of the hands, you are mm -hmm. screwed in that case. So the bigger it is this percentage and the more able you are to average where the money comes from, the better odds in order to the company for success. And I've seen mm. people that invest a lot of money in video games, just one guy paying $20,000 a month because he's super engaged to a video game. That's insane. Wow. But that is wow. your poker hand. You lose that guy, you lose $20,000, it's a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very interesting. So effectively by uh, making some of these adjustments with clustering and machine learning techniques, uh, you're able to double uh, the amount of money that uh, is spent and reduce the probability of losing a customer by, by two. That's, that's huge, those are huge results. Yes, and even if we don't talk about money and we talk about the engagement, you would be also surprised of how many people just download the game and just do uh, one game without, uh, and leaves the game. What, what's the percentage, mm -hmm. do you think? Oh, probably quite high, maybe like 50%? 50%, uh, yeah, 50%, 60% of people, even up to 80%, just wow. open the game, does one game, and then leave. So you can wow. see that the potential group of people to monetize grow, uh, grow, goes down with just a few minutes of gameplay. What does it mean? Mm -hmm. It means that is a long tail distribution, and the bigger it is the tail, the more chances to monetize them. So what would you do as a data science in order to increase that tail? Um, well, I would uh, somehow focus on increasing engagement. At the first stage, the, yeah. more, the bigger the engagement is at the first stage, the slower the tail will go after some amount of time. So yeah. the critical stage is the first game, even if there is a second game. How we do that? Tweaking the randomness. Tweaking the randomness means that the first game that you do on a video game, it's probably fake. It's, it's already prepared for you to win and it's already prepared for you to have a really nice experience. The better ah. the first experience is, the bigger it is the, the, the tail in the end. So now I am developing a lot of secrets from the video games to you and your audience, yeah. but you can see that a lot of those games always tend to let you win the first stage and you are not really playing with anybody. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. It's similar to online education. Uh, the first experience, like first few lectures really matter. If you, as an instructor, record very boring and um, like uh, not interesting first few lectures, then people are, even if later on you have the best materials ever, people are never gonna get to it. So it's super important that at the very start, you show um, your students how what they will learn and, and get them excited about it. It's the same principle. This is the gamification we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And this gamification is super important because the more engaged people are in one product, in one service, could be a video game, could be an online course, could be your podcast, uh, the more chances it is that these people will come back and they will last longer on your product. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, how can data scientists use engagement or gamification in their day-to-day -day job? So how can data scientists use gamification in uh, their day-to-day -day job, uh, which unrelated to the industry of gaming? 
This is a really interesting question because for me, gamification is the clue for a success. The more engaged people is in one in doing one thing, the better odds of that uh, becoming a, a success in the future. So in that case, when when a data scientist is trying to do uh, some kind of analysis or whatever, he can think in terms of about a simple ranking, for instance. A ranking is a way of gamifying things and try to do three, four, five different algorithms, establish some score, could be an R squared, could be a p-value, could be whatever you want, ratio of success. And when you rank them out, you see, okay, this is my ranking. My best algorithm is this one and the worst is that other one. Let's pick the worst one and let's see if we do some fine tuning is able to escalate some uh, steps far beyond the first one. And you do it iteratively. You try to investigate more algorithms and more ways of doing things until you have this super ranking that is not able to beat anybody at the other. It's mm -hmm. more or less that these Kaggle competitions, they are gamified because you see mm -hmm. this ranking technique that they apply in order to see, okay, who's the best one solving this problem? That's the same, but for your own problem. Also, it's really interesting because if you work with a group of people instead of being yourself, you could uh, use some achievement system, even some badges. You could uh, start gamifying like a video game would be. And that is super interesting because you try to always be the other one or get, get this achievement or get this badge that you don't have by thinking out of the box. Mm -hmm. The problem I see in data science is that when you are able to do three, four, five algorithms, you try to solve everything with those algorithms without investigating further uh, out of there. This is, you know, like knowing how to use a, a hammer and a driller from your toolbox, and you try to use that for everything. So when you have to take out a screw, you use the hammer or you use the driller or something like that instead of going to the screwdriver. So it's like that, but in terms of machine learning or, or data science, knowing five or six algorithms is good, being able to investigate or take a step further, do some fine tuning, reading some papers is going the extra mile. And this is gamification. Hmm. That's gamification for myself, right? Like learning new things for myself. How about gamification for uh, the, the clients, for, for instance, stakeholders, if you're doing a presentation, often data science presentations or um, results, uh, reports can be kind of like dry. How can, is there a way data scientists can use the gamification to engage their audience, the stakeholders of the project more? Well, in fact, I did it with you. I answered, uh, I, I asked you two times, what do you think that's the stage of this and that on the other one? Let's uh, make them part of the presentation. Uh, ask some questions. Answering a question can be a rewarding system when you answer correctly and can be a really good way for you to teach something that they don't know. The typical problem when you deal with a client is the language of the client and the language of the data science is not the same. They are thinking some things and you are thinking any way different. No? It's that tell me what you want and I will show you what you really want. It's a different language. So doing that during a presentation, okay, what do you think is this ratio? Or what do you think is the best algorithm? Or between these three game profilers, which one do you think generates more money? The people that pay or the people that watch this advertisement? This is a communication. You are not lecturing, you are teaching. So this is important because this communication helps a lot on the on the engagement or on the gamification of the situation that's just one example there could be a lot more mm. that's very interesting i realize now when you ask me like how many do you think percentage of people convert from players to payers right so that's an example of gamification indeed it it makes me more more in, engaged in the conversation you do it a lot when you create your courses you try to anticipate the, the student to what will happen. Okay, this is what we have right now. What do you think will happen? The client will purchase, will drop out, will become a video watcher, advertiser watcher. You try to anticipate when you do your courses or I do mine. So mm -hmm. the, you, we do it so naturally that we are, that we are not 
really conscious of what's happening behind that. But that's what it is. We are creating a gamification experience in teaching as well. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, speaking of teaching, you not only teach on Udemy, um, you also teach uh, at the university, right? You're an associate professor. Tell us a bit about that. How did you get into becoming um, teaching at uni? That's interesting because the same at the same moment I quit my job and I started teaching online, I got a call from a teacher at the university. Hey, there is one option for you to come back to the university. There is some linear algebra classes that you could give. It's not a lot of time, just four hours per week. If you're interested of coming back to the university, think that when I, when I quit the, the master in Paris, I lose all the opportunities to come back to the university. I was able to go to that master be, because this university here was able to get me this scholarship to go over there because of my notes or my behaviors or whatever. But they helped me on that. When I left this master, I break all kinds of relationship with this university. <laughs> yeah, they and must have been pretty... quite upset. Yeah, they were because I was supposed to come back from this master, teach them what I've learned in Paris and all that stuff that yeah. it breaks out when I come back for a girl. So they call me, hey, there is this opportunity. Okay, let's try that. Four hours per week, it's not a lot. Let's see what it, how it goes. And it was really related with my online teaching that I was starting back in 2015. And I think that it's the best I've done because when you teach online, it's like, you know, doing this podcast and not seeing you, not seeing your face, not seeing your reaction. And it's really cold. You don't know what the other one is doing. Could be sleeping, could be uh, looking at their mobile phone. I don't know what they are doing when they take one of my online courses. But when I teach at the university and I see all the faces, I am able to see, okay, now am I boring yeah. all the audience? So let's make a change. Or this is not the correct way of doing things. This is too complicated. Let's make it simple. And this is the best feedback I've had for the last five years because by watching the different phases, year after year, despite I am teaching the same subject, I am able to improve it, to tweak it, and even get best results year after year. Mm. Wow, that's really cool. And I think anybody can replicate that in their career. Uh, you, when you're presenting to people, whether it's uh, live in the, real, in the real world or virtually now with, with the situation we're in, um, try to observe that feedback or even record, the ask someone to record the presentation. Of course, ask permission from the people in the audience, but if it's possible, record it and, uh, and then watch it later and see how, how you sound, how people react and all these things. It's very powerful, as you say, to analyze yourself, not just to present and okay, it's done, but actually go through the painful experience of listening and watching yourself and, and understanding um, where you can do better. Yeah, it gets you a, a really nice way to watch of what you do, what are your gestures, how you move your hands, how you move yourself, how you position yourself. If you are mm -hmm. becoming lazy and you start to getting one side or the other or mm -hmm. whatever, it, it helps you improve your position talking in, in public. And it also helps you to become a, a, a better teacher I always say that I don't teach for the smartest one. I teach on the other side for the dumbest one. So, so if the one that has a lot of more difficult to learn is able to learn, all the others will also be able to learn. If you teach mm -hmm. for the smartest one, only this guy and the smarter on the room will follow you. All the other ones are lost. It's like this gamification experience we were talking in video games, this long tail is aimed to improve the first experience in order to improve the, the tail. The same thing happens when you teach. The first moment you go into the class, the first topics you teach are the ones that will decide if you engage this audience or they will drop out. So the final goal is for them to pass your subject or for you to teach linear algebra, calculus, machine learning, data science, whatever. But it's these first moments and it's this first experience that you need to be aware of because otherwise you will lose them during all the path. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's uh, very interesting. And uh, speaking of students and learning, um, what's the difference for someone learning data science at a university versus online? What what are your comments uh, on the two? If you're in a unique position that you teach in both cases, right? So, um, do you think online education will take over university education with time, or is there a place for both? Right now, in fact, due to the coronavirus thing, I see it more clearly than before. What mm. is the purpose of having a university right now? To expand on paper. On paper mm -hmm. that says Juan Gabriel has a mathematics degree or has this teaching education master, whatever. Is the whole purpose of having a university, this paper. Because the best teachers are not on a university, are outside the world with their experiences, and they can share their knowledge through online courses, for instance. So what's what I'm facing right now? I use my same online courses in, in the teaching of the university. For instance, I teach at the Master of Data Science here in, in Mallorca, and I use our machine learning from A to Z in Spanish. That's the topic we cover for my subject. And they're super excited to have all the content online, all the community, access to the forums with the questions of the other people that I don't see the point of going to the university, to the class and teach that with a board or a projector or whatever. So mm. what I think is that the university will be the only way we will have to expand some official papers that says you have this master or this other thing. but as soon as more companies realize that this paper is not worth, and what is worth is the abilities, the things that you are able to show on an interview, the things that you are able to do when you work on that company, they will have to make a shift because online courses will be as valuable as a title from a university. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't okay. know if wow. you agree with me or not. Um. I, I like you. I like your thinking. I think the universities um, have a lot of reputation behind them, a lot of um, like uh, brand recognition, and they can use that in a hybrid model. For instance, a university could partner up with um, a company that already does online education, and the university could look through the education and if they're happy with everything it is they could put their stamp behind it and create like a create these hybrid models where uh, i think the sooner universities start realizing this and getting into it like those universities that start first will will really expand because um why not right like why not learn online and get the certificate of approval from I don't know, Harvard or the University of Mallorca or, or somewhere else. Like that, that's the two birds with one stone. Yes. The only problem is that universities are really conservative and they want to have their own teachers. They want to have their own materials, their own brand, as you say. And I mm -hmm. think it will take a lot of time in that case. Mm -hmm. I think that this coronavirus will make a, a change in the education because Right now, probably 2020, 2021, 2022, we'll have to adapt to an online education. And mm. there will be two ways of doing that. You have to create your own materials from scratch, despite you don't have the confidence to talk on a camera or you don't have access to this kind of way of teaching or you are not able to do that. Or go to some materials that are already created by someone around the, the earth and use those materials you could have access to the best recordings of Kirill or the best recordings from a teacher of Harvard or something like that with just one click away. And I think that's the way to go. As you said, if you already have these materials, if it was a book, you wouldn't write again your book. You would recommend that book that has already the materials. I think that with yeah. online courses or videos already recorded would be like that in the future. Or at least I hope that it is like that because it's the natural way of expanding. If there is already good materials, why to reinvent the wheel twice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Agree. Uh, tell, let's talk a bit about uh, the data science 
world in the English speaking world versus in the Spanish speaking world? What have you observed? You've been part of both. Again, very unique position. Like, how is data science developing? Is it different uh, in the Spanish speaking world or is it exactly the same as in the English speaking world? I think there is not a lot of difference because a lot of algorithms start with papers written in English and they adapt even with English terminology. In Spanish, NL NLP, Natural Language Processing, would be Procesamiento de Lenguajes Naturales, which would be PNL, the other, the other way around. But we mm. don't use PNL. We use this is the natural way of, of talking on how you learn all that stuff. This is just one. One, one that really confuses me is... Uh... Uh, Inteligenso Artificial, right? Is IA. And I see a lot of people using IA. Yeah. Uh, well, there are a lot of people that translate these small words, but I don't see the point of doing that. If you just say NLP, a Spanish knows about artificial intelligence will be able to follow your, your speech. Yeah. So yeah. there's not really a lot of difference. The problem that I see is there is a lot of people that don't know English. The, their lack of basis in English is what they uh, are facing right now. And that's their biggest mistake, perhaps, that they should know a little more about English or to how to read a paper or how to read the documentation. Python documentation is in English. R documentation is in English. And sometimes I see a lot of people just copy pasting on Google to translate to Spanish. Instead of, okay, let's do one extra effort and learn a little bit about English so we are able to follow the whole meaning, at least, of the function you are using or the paper you are reading. So that is the only difference uh, I see. Okay, okay. Um, uh, and how about in terms of students? So you have 200,000 students on Udemy. Um, do you see a growth in the number of like in the interest in the space of data science, like for instance, in the in the US, it exploded, huge rise in um, job offers, job demands, and there's a, like a lot of people wanting to get into data science. Has that been the same in Latin America or in Spain, or has is it uh, is there like a lag behind it? Are you seeing the same explosive growth? Uh, what's going on there? I think it's two three years behind. So this explosion has just uh, begun one year ago, more or less. But the point here is that data science is a general word for so many different things yeah. that in Spanish, it's even wider because it could be a marketing director just doing some Excel and he could call himself data scientist in that case. So it's so general, uh, at least at their first stages, that talking about data science is, you know, just talking about using Excel in that case or using technology. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in this case, I think that, yeah, we are really behind the English market in that case. But I also see that month after month, a lot of people is asking about this. What's the difference between machine learning, artificial intelligence, data science? even learning mathematics, because I always say that mathematics is really important to know what you're doing. The, the biggest problems I see with people that is taking machine learning or data science courses without the basics. I don't, I don't say that you will need a, a degree in mathematics, but it's important to know the basics. The biggest problem I see is that they don't know about the elementary things that apply one technique to one, uh, some pieces of data, and they have singular matrix problem. Okay, what's happening? What I did wrong? The problem is that you don't think about the data you have. The pro probably you have multicollinearity or any kind of problem behind that. But since you don't know what that means, the, it's just applying some recipe without knowing the ingredients you have. Is it? So that is the problem I see, that a lot of people want to go into data science, want to go into machine learning, but they want to go the fast way around instead of having all the basics that then you will have. Even I face people that, hey, I don't know how to code. May I take your artificial intelligence course? The answer is no, for sure. You need to code. <laughs> or else it's like, no, it's like trying to learn Japanese without 
having the basics or trying to write a book in Japanese without knowing the language. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Very, very cool. And so um, you, you're seeing that in, in the Spanish market that people rush into data science like that. Yeah. And day after day, I see it m more because I, I see a lot of people follow me on, on LinkedIn and a lot of people that say data science in blah, 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 data science in that company, in the other, in the other. But when you take a look uh, at that, you see that these people that never did an analysis, or at least they don't share anything about data or they don't follow uh, any, any website where they publish something about data analytics. So that's interesting because you call yourself data science or your position in the company is data science because someone at human resources told you so. But you later on, you don't do data science. You just do an Excel compilation or you just grab data from a database and you put it on a file. That's it. End of story. So mm -hmm. I see that this is a really misused word in the Spanish market, at least. Hmm. I think that's um, uh, kind of like a consequence of that. It's the boom is just happening now. And a lot of people still don't understand what it means. And I think with time. Uh, even in the English market, it still requires time for it to become more formalized and um, clear. But there's a lot of opportunities in that. When there's uh, not enough structure, that means there's a lot of inefficiencies and that means you can really stand out. And so following your advice, like just doing it methodically, uh, doing learning all the fundamentals, understanding what you're talking about, and then going into it, you can really be the data scientist that everybody desires rather than just a uh, wannabe data scientist, if, uh, if that term can be used. For sure. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Well, Juan Gabriel, I can't believe how fast this hour flew by. It's, uh, it's already been an hour. Um, I wanted to ask you, I guess, uh, one more question on, uh, before we start wrapping up. And that's, what would your, you know, given all your experience and all the things uh, you've seen in your career, what uh, would you say, where are you say, where would you say we're going in terms of data science? What's the future in the next like three years for the industry, not just in the Spanish market or overall for data science? And what should our listeners uh, do in order to prepare for the future that's coming? I think that we've reached a point where all the technologies have been applied to the different fields on machine learning or artificial intelligence that now, in 2020, is toolbox we were talking about. We have a super prepared toolbox to solve any kind of problem, more or less. So I think that this is the perfect problem to start learning how to use this toolbox in the different aspects. I see a lot of companies that weren't worried about data, about data science, about machine learning a few months uh, ago. But after this coronavirus, they need to start worrying about this data and apply uh, correctly these techniques. So I think that on the next years, it's the perfect moment to start applying all this knowledge on machine learning or on artificial intelligence to real problems, to uh, business problems, to industrial problems, to medical problems like the, this virus around. And I think that we probably won't see an improvement or new techniques, not as at least as big as we saw on the last few years, despite probably from Google or uh, OpenAI or something like that, that they always in, invest in new R&D projects. But for the usage of those techniques, I think it's the perfect moment for start using all these toolbox that this last cent, uh, that this la last decade has provided us. Mm. I love that. That's really cool. That's really cool. It's now focusing on the usage. Um, it's like the that trade off between exploitation and exploration in AI, right? Yes, it's a lot of exactly work. the same. Now it's the moment to start using those things, and I mm. think that the coolest one that everybody should know about is the NLP and the chatbots and the automatization, I think that with the latest algorithms, now it's the perfect moment to automatize things that would be done by a human. And I'm talking really big on that. Here in Spain, for instance, 
the taxes are still done manually. There is one person reviewing everything. Okay, this is an expense. This is not. This can go this way. This can go the other one. Well, now is the moment to start relying of this difficult job and also a human error job uh, mm -hmm. with automatization on the AI side. And I think that creating chatbots, creating uh, automatic answering, even for us on online learning, having the possibility to answer automatically a question by looking for all the previous questions or even the transcription of our, uh, of our own video would be interesting. For, you, uh, for instance, yourself on the, on the podcast, uh, what Juan Gabriel thinks about the future of data science? Asking one question like that, and one bot being able to prompt to the exam moment where we talked about those things. I think that is the perfect moment because we have the technology, we have the knowledge. Now is the moment to use that for something useful. And I think that's the perfect place for somebody to start into the world of the artificial intelligence or the data science. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's absolutely right. Um, yeah, so... Very, very interesting. There's lots of cool things, lots of scary things that can be done with NLP, right? Um, I heard of a story uh, where this was just not even NLP. This was like a proper deep fake with NLP and uh, uh, video when somebody in Canada called like an accounting department of a company and it was the CEO calling. I don't, I don't remember if it was a video or just phone call. And they said to pay $200,000 to an account and they moved the money and it was actually not the CEO calling. It was like a fake uh, image. So there's, possible, there's good things and bad things that can be done, right? Yeah. Last week I was reading also about, uh, I think it was Jordan from your team that sent me one link about how an artificial intelligence wrote a whole post and it was marked as the hacker of the set of the decade, the hack of the decade, oh. because they thought that it was a real new, but it was absolutely a fake new generated by, by some NLP using this GPT-3 that is so powerful right now. Fake news. Yeah. yeah. Wow, wow. GPT-3, yeah. Cool. Okay, well, <laughs> let's see how it goes, right? Let's see where this all takes us. It will be interesting. Yeah, but well, this is, you know, it's like the, the change of this century, probably. Back in the 19th century, when they uh, started discovering the, the shift from the steam machine, later on, the electricity, all that stuff, relied of a lot of work and created new kinds of position. Mm -hmm. That is what will happen. Why would you have a lot of people reviewing, you know, the taxes one by one, or why would you have a lot of people answering one by one if we can automatize these things with artificial intelligence or machine learning? For sure, those people will have to learn new things, probably management of those techniques or uh, fine tuning of the parameters behind those algorithms. They have to switch from one job to the other. It doesn't mean that we are taking these people out uh, without any kind of job. No, that means that their job should evolve like all these algorithms are evolving during the last year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's just a question of speed. You know, like before with electricity and steam engine, yeah. um, the speed was not as high. You could, you could change your job and have time to learn. Uh, now it's just going to happen so fast. Will people have time to learn and requalify for new jobs? And just also jobs lasted for... 35, 40 years, 50 years working on the same position for a person is a lot of time. Right now, there is no person working more than three, four, five years, even on the same position because the position changes, the company or even the technology. The technology changes so fast that we have to be updated the more than we can. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Well, Juan Gabriel, thank you so much. Um, before we wrap up, where's the best places to find you for our listeners? They can find me on LinkedIn. It's Juan Gabriel Gomila Salas. It's in Spanish. It's easy to recognize mm -hmm. me. And mm -hmm. uh, also on my website, frogames.es, where they can find uh, everything we've talked about. They have my TED Talk. They have all the online courses, even the learning paths 
all the different careers like video games, like machine learning, data science, even mathematics. And for sure, if they want to follow my travels, I know that I don't travel right now, but my possible future travels, I post a lot about the different places I go. Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram is the perfect places to, to find me. Again, look for Juan Gabriel Gomila and it's easy to find. Awesome. Fantastic. Fantastic. And uh, one uh, last question. What's a book? I know you wanted to recommend several books. So what are the books you'd like to recommend? Yeah, they got really related with the story I told you about how I started and all those stuff. And there is yeah. one for each kind of, diff- of uh, topic we covered. The first one is called uh, Heads First Data Analysis. It's a really old book from 20, 20 you know, it was, uh, yeah, 2009 from Michael Milton. It's super cool because it's, it shows you about the basic knowledge you need to know to start on data science. It starts doing, you know, a simple linear regression. Then the story goes on, but this regression has an outlier. So the next month, the model is not accurate and you need to learn how to identify outliers. When you have that, you start learning new things. And it's super cool because it's a whole story from a guy that is learning data science from their beginning, doing a simple linear regression to the end, presenting the final job to the boss and becoming a successful data scientist. It's super easy to read. And this is one that changed my perspective from mathematician to data to data scientist. The second one, I think that you recommended that also is called The Lean Startup. It helped me a lot when I started creating my own courses and becoming my own boss because it helps you to identify these possible needs of, of, your, of your business, to how to talk to the different clients, how to be aware of everything new and how to manage your own company. So I think it's a book that everybody that an entrepreneur should read about. It really gives you a, a little clue about what's happening and how to face all these different uh, things that you de- have to deal with the entrepreneurship. And the last one, it's called Gamification by Design from Gabe Zimmerman, which is super interesting because is the things we talked about gamification apply to everything. It talks about game theory, which is a field of uh, politics and economics used a lot, and how that game theory is applied to the different aspects until you uh, uh, up to uh, problems of the real life, like gamifying uh, the education, gamifying uh, the management of your team, that everything that happens on your company. So I think it's really a, a, a nice reading for all the people that want to gamify their own experiences day by day. Wow, thank you. So we've got Head First Data Analysis, The Lean Startup, and Gamification by Design. That's it. Awesome. I think they awesome. are all available on, on Amazon and all that stuff. So it, they're really easy to, to find. Cool. Thanks for your recommendations, Juan Gabriel. Um, and yeah, on that note, thanks a lot for coming on the show. It was really fun chatting to you. Yeah, thank you very much. And I hope that we will keep collaborating because I think that I learned a lot from you. I, I haven't said that on the show, but I learned a lot from your, from your courses. And these collaborations, porting these algorithms to Spanish, has been a way for me to keep the track of machine learning or artificial intelligence and even gamify my own experience. Over there on my, on my studio, I have uh, a blackboard with Kirill course completed 25%, 28%, 25%. And this is the completion of both the course and the translation. And this is my gamified experience to keep translating courses into Spanish and learning as well. Fantastic. I, I, that's really cool to hear. You're very organized. And I, I also hope we will continue. Thank you for translating so many courses uh, that give access to them to so many people like I saw uh, just today. So that your uh, Spanish version of machine learning A to Z has like, I think, 11,000 reviews, just the reviews, right? So that's a huge number of students there. And uh, it's always very great to hear that, oh, see that uh, more and more people can access this knowledge. Yeah, I, I see a lot of students that uh, thanks me for translating the courses because it's, it's like one of your sentences. It's like democratizing the knowledge behind the machine learning or the artificial intelligence. 
and being able to approach that to people that don't know English or are not able to follow uh, a class in, in English. And I think that is the future or the key of my success, at least it has been to port materials or create materials in my own language, in, in Spanish. Back in 2015, there was no course in Spanish in on Udemy, for instance. So I think the key, bringing the knowledge to your mother language so you are able to understand everything clearly and become a data scientist or an engineer on video games or on artificial intelligence. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, all right, thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you in Mallorca, yeah? Hopefully, absolutely. Yeah, sure, we have a barbecue here when everything goes normal, so you're invited. <laughs> awesome, I'll see you there. <laughs> okay. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That was Juan Gabriel Gomila. Hope you enjoyed this conversation. You got energized from it. My personal favorite takeaway was uh, the whole notion of gamification and applying it uh, not just in the gaming industry, but overall in uh, your life, in your career. And it was really cool how Juan Gabriel then illustrated, was like subtly applying it in our conversation and then I illustrated how he was indeed doing that by asking me uh, questions like trying, uh, getting me to guess those percentages, how many people convert from player to player and that other second time. Um, that really helped keep me engaged, kept me engaged. Uh, and uh, that's a, um, a way you can also have help people be more engaged in your presentations. Uh, think about it next time you're presenting something uh, to uh, your team, to your manager, uh, at work, see what kind of questions you can ask your audience to get them engaged. I think that's a very powerful tip. And uh, as always, you can find the show notes at superdatascience.com slash 403. That's superdatascience.com slash 403. Juan Gabriel teaches a lot of um, uh, courses in Spanish, data science courses in Spanish. So we'll put up the top three of his Spanish courses in the show notes at uh, that link. So if you are interested in learning data science in Spanish, then check it out. If maybe that's your mother tongue, uh, he has translated some of our courses. He's got some courses of his own, and he's a fantastic instructor for over 200,000 students on Udemy. Uh, so that serves as a testament to his way of teaching. Uh, make sure to check them out. And also, if you know somebody, if you just know someone who um, wants to learn data science or is interested in the space, but maybe language has been a barrier for them. Maybe their mother tongue is Spanish and they haven't been able to find quality uh, courses on the topic in Spanish. Well, this is your chance to help them out. Just send them the link superdatascience.com slash 403. And once again, we'll include the top three courses by Juan Gabriel there and they'll be able to uh, proceed to those courses and check them out for themselves. There we go, uh, share the love, send uh, that to one of your friends. And uh, as always, thank you so much for being here today. Super pumped that you're continuing with uh, the Super Data Science Podcast and I look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, happy analyzing. <laughs>